So, in the last month on my channel, we have looked at the most popular gaming platform in the UK during the 80s, the ZX Spectrum. We have looked at the most popular games console, the Sega Master System. We have had an in-depth look at why the NES failed in the UK. And we have even looked at why microcomputers were successful as a whole. Today, we take a look at another competitor in the 80s microcomputer race, Amstrad. The Amstrad CPC 464 was my very first ever gaming platform, in which I received all the way back in 1989, when I was only 3 years old. Many American nostalgic gaming memories regarding the 80s often revolve around the NES. I, on the other hand, along with so many other Brits, have most of my 80s gaming memories tied up into one of the microcomputers instead. Before we look at the platform itself, let's take a look at the history of the bloody thing. As I have mentioned previously on my channel, microcomputers were absolutely thriving in the UK over this period. During the 80s there was no video game crash, and gaming was huge business. There were many successful platforms that came prior to Amstrad's entry to the market, most notably the Commodore 64 and British microcomputers such as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and the BBC Acorn. With any success story though, and any perceived craze, every greedy businessman then wants a slice of the pie, and Amstrad's entry into the microcomputer market was under the leadership of company owner Alan Sugar. When I went to write this review, I had every intention of poking fun at this man. Essentially, I was going to laugh at him and refer to him as the UK's answer to Donald Trump. After all, they're both greedy entrepreneurs and were both stars of The Apprentice in their respective countries. However, upon further inspection, Sugar deserves a hell of a lot more respect than I initially thought. Most of these greedy power mad businessmen, like Donald Trump for example, are often born with silver spoons in their mouth. Donald Trump's rich parents loaned him $1 million in the bloody 70s to start his business. So with a platform like that, is he really a real success story at all? Alan Sugar, on the other hand, was a lad from a bloody council estate in Hackney in East London. Yuck. He left school at 16 with little in the way of education and worked his way up in the world from a total peasant to a bloody billionaire. I am sorry, but that is an accolade that deserves respect, as unlike Trump, Sugar is completely self-made and hasn't relied on his mummy and daddy for handouts. Alan Sugar is the everyman, just like each and every one of us. So there you go, Alan Sugar, now known as Baron Alan Sugar, would probably make a better leader of the free world than Donald Trump. But hey, that's just a theory, a game theory. Thanks for watching. So now we have established who Alan Sugar is, let's look at Amstrad itself. Sugar founded Amstrad in 1968. The company began as a general importer, exporter and wholesaler, but soon specialised in consumer electronics. By 1970, the first manufacturing venture was underway. He achieved lower production prices by using injection moulding plastics for hi-fi turntable covers, severely undercutting competitors who used vacuum forming processes. Manufacturing capacity was soon expanded to include the production of audio amplifiers and tuners. So basically, by the 1980s, Amstrad was doubling profit every year, and by the 80s, they decided to enter the extremely lucrative microcomputer market. Yeah! The main thing Amstrad did to stand out from their competition was to simplify things for the consumer. Normally, in order to use a traditional microcomputer, you would need to hook it up to a separate tape deck to run games and software, and also hook it up to a television in order to use it as a monitor. The Amstrad CPC 464, on the other hand, came with a tape deck built into the keyboard and its very own monitor. This was so that others in the household could continue to watch television while someone else was playing bloody games. Throughout 1984, the CPC 464 was launched in the UK, France, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Spain and Italy. It was followed by the CPC 664 model and CPC 6128 models. Later plus variants of the 464 and 6128 launched in 1990 which increased their functionality slightly. Over the years Amstrad sold 4 million microcomputers worldwide. Apart from the all-in-one unit thing, 
Other advantages the device had over its competition was that Amstrad were never stupid enough to try to break America. They saw how that turned out for other microcomputer manufacturers, so just avoided the region altogether. Another primary factor that helped shift the system was that Mr. Sugar identified that the likes of the Spectrum, Commodore 64 etc sold like hotcakes in the past, mainly so that people could play games. Although this was the case, those other companies never tried to push that as their main purpose of their products. After all, that would have been seen as a little bit juvenile and low brow. Mr. Sugar on the other hand fully embraced this and even released loads of games under the development name of Amsoft. Many people's first contact with software on an Amstrad home computer would have been by playing one of the Amsoft titles. Several titles would normally even come packed in as part of the sales bundle. Overall, with the aid of the all-in-one system, combined with clever marketing revolved around games, it wasn't long before Amstrad were completely dominating the microcomputer market in the UK. By the time 1986 came around, Amstrad bought out its main competition Sinclair Research and this included worldwide rights to sell and manufacture all existing and future Sinclair computers and computer products. This of course included the mighty ZX Spectrum. Amstrad made more than £5 million on selling all of the old Sinclair surplus machines and going on from there Amstrad even launched two new variants of the Spectrum. These were the Spectrum Plus 2 and the ZX Spectrum Plus 3. The ZX Spectrum Plus 2 is personally my favourite model of the Spectrum I own simply for its all-in-one nature which of course is similar to that of the Amstrad. But of course we have already talked about the Spectrum on this channel, so this episode is all about the CPC-464. So let's take a close up look at the system itself. The look of this platform epitomises gaming nostalgia for me. I had one of these things sitting in my bedroom between the time I was 3 years old and 16 years old. We then moved away and my bloody mother chucked it in a skip. However, a few weeks ago I finally coughed up the money to buy myself another one. Yeah! I personally think from the keyboard with its multicoloured buttons and tape deck to the big black monitor displaying a blue screen, the whole thing just reeks of serious business. When I was 3 years old I owned a proper looking computer to game on, rather than one of those kiddie looking Nintendo Entertainment Systems. What even was that thing? Every time I would load up a game to play, it felt like an event in itself. I'd admire the box art, even though I couldn't read the title yet. I would then put the cassette in, making sure it was the right way around, then carefully enter a few commands in which I memorised from what my dad taught me. After that, I would just sit back and wait. The loading process to start each game generally only took about 6 minutes. However, it was so exciting that it would sometimes feel like an eternity to me. Usually during this process, you would hear the keyboard making all sorts of weird noises. Similarly to the noises I'd hear when I started booting up AOL nearly a decade later. So thinking about it, AOL is like nostalgia inception for me, ha <laughs> ha Whilst the loading times may have been a tad annoying, owning a microcomputer certainly had a lot of advantages to that of a console. NES owners at the time would be cursed with only having a few games, whilst I on the other hand had bloody loads. I had so many, I don't think I ever even got round to playing them all. As mentioned in other videos I have made, games for microcomputers were extremely cheap to purchase, and on top of that, if you had an extra tape deck, you could just copy them and give spares to your friends. If I remember correctly, a large percentage of games I owned were bloody pirated, but it was things like that what made microcomputers so much better than games consoles in the 80s. Cheap games, easy piracy, the swinging 80s, everybody was doing it. Yeah! There were over 1,400 games released for the Amstrad CPC-464. With a computer I've only recently reacquired, I am still learning all the time about this system's vast library. So now I am going to tell you about a mix of some of the key titles for the system and some of the titles I enjoyed most as a child. Briefly though, before I talk about games individually, I thought I would quickly talk about the Amstrad's mascot, Roland. 
Roland was a rather odd mascot, who in which took many forms. In fact, Slope's Game Room has done a whole video about the complete history of all the Roland games. So if you want to know about them in more detail, then I suggest you watch that video following this one. Today, I'll just be talking about the best two Roland games. Roland in the Caves is actually an enhanced port slash remake of the ZX Spectrum game Bugaboo. In this game, Roland takes the form of a flea. Roland with his long legs accidentally falls through a crack in the planet's surface and falls to the very bottom of a cavern. The player must control Roland and guide him back to the top of the cavern and out to the safety of the planet's surface. This is easier said than done though. As in all the years I've been playing this game, I have personally never made it out of the cavern. Roland may fall from any distance without dying. However, he will die any time he makes contact with the large pterodactyl-like thing. This creature wanders around trying to eat you as you try to escape. You can however get away from the pterodactyl by carefully leaping away or by taking refuge inside one of the smaller caverns that are located around the play area. The controls of this game are really simple, just a left jump and a right jump. When you hold down one of these keys, a gauge at the bottom of the screen begins to fill up. When the key is released, Roland will jump in that direction, with the strength of the jump being determined by how long the key was held down for. The cavern is made up of various rocky ledges which Roland may land on, however he can only stand on flat areas and if the jump is mistimed, Roland may end up on an angled area of rock or miss the ledge altogether, which will cause him to fall straight down landing on whatever is below. This is a fun unique game and amongst my favourite games on the platform. A game I missed out on as a child but have grown to appreciate is Roland on the Ropes. This game is another Spectrum port slash conversion, this time of the game Fred. This time Roland takes the form of an Indiana Jones like explorer in a platform game within a maze. This maze is full of simplistic ladders, ropes, enemies and platforms to traverse. Like Roland in the caves, this is another game about escaping and Roland must do everything in his power to get out of the tomb he finds himself in. You start the game out at the lowest level of the tomb and must endeavour to find your way through the maze and to the top. Being the intrepid Roland, you are able to jump over the rats to escape them and to defend yourself, you can shoot at the mummies, skeletons or vampires that come to attack you. To be perfectly honest with you, Roland is far from one of the greatest platformers ever created, but it is notable for being one of the better titles Amsoft created. Who Dares Wins 2 truly was one of my all-time childhood favourites. At the game's core, it is a clone of Capcom's hit arcade game Commando. There are plenty of direct comparisons between the two games, such as general art style, the presence of torn up buildings that enemies sometimes jump from, enemy death animations and so on. This is just such a bloody fun run and gun game. Maybe I'll revisit it and give it a standalone review on this channel down the line. This is a game I feel which deserves a lot more hype than it is currently receiving. Arkanoid was the first game I ever played of the Brick Breaker genre. This simple game from the intro to the graphics and music absolutely oozes with nostalgia for me. I think I may have played this game more than I did any other on the platform. Arkanoid is a game developed by Taito in 1986. It is clearly based upon Atari's breakout games of the 1970s and the title refers to the doomed mothership from which the player's ship escapes. Much like the game Breakout, the player controls the Vulse, a space vessel that acts as the game's paddle which prevents a ball from falling from the playing field, attempting to bounce it against a number of bricks. Again, this is a really simple game to control as you only need to hit left and right for directions and use the space bar to launch your balls. Throughout the game you also get various power ups to mix up the action. Electro Freddy was another game I had a lot of fun with back in the day. Looking at the game I always assumed you played as a scouser trying to steal old VCRs and hi-fis from the home of Rolf Harris. Essentially the aim of the game was to hover above various tech push it onto a conveyor belt, all whilst at the same time trying to avoid that sexual predator Rolf Harris. On each level after you have stolen every VCR on the screen, you must then obtain a key which allows you to move on to the next level. This is a simple game where each level only consists of one screen, but in my opinion it is simplicity at its finest. 
Another game that I always found rather captivating in my early days was Fire Ant. In this game you control an ant that must rescue the Queen Ant which has been taken hostage by a group of scorpions. She is being held in the 8th chamber but to reach her you must navigate a series of tunnels that are being patrolled by scorpions. In order to do this you use objects scattered throughout the chambers in which you use to proceed to the next one. These objects include getting keys that open yellow doors and explosives that will detonate walls. Objects placed at the proper location usually cause a chain reaction that clear the obstacles. Occasionally scorpions are seen laying eggs and getting these eggs will award you with bonus points. When the queen ant is rescued the game resets to the first chamber once again. So that was just a taste of some of the 1400 games that Amstrad CPC 464 has to offer. Those were not necessarily the best games the system has to offer, but they were certainly some of my favourite games in which I grew up with. To summarise, the Amstrad was the platform that started it all gaming wise for me, and without it in my life, who knows whether I would have acquired such a keen interest in retro games today. Is the Amstrad worth playing today? Well, with over 1,400 games combined with an interesting history and fantastically rich colour palette, I personally think it is amongst the most intriguing platforms of the entire period. Let me know in the comments section what was your first ever gaming platform and what you thought of the Amstrad CPC 464 from this video. If you like what you saw today, don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video with your friends. Relating to this same story, I have also made a video of why the NES failed in Europe and another video on if the ZX Spectrum is still worth playing today. Shout outs to Jarrett Tolzian, Bricky's Lad, Mad 8 Productions, Andreas Larson, Peter Zidane, Diego Pereira and all of my other patrons. Thank you all for your support. Yeah! And if you want to be added to this prestigious list, then check out my Patreon page. Ta-ta and farewell.